Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. I want to welcome you to the program. Glad you could be with us today. I want to thank our underwriter, audiobooks.com for making this program possible. Today we have a splendid book, a, a challenging book, I would say, because it is, uh, it is quite sweeping in its um, landscape, if we can call it that. The book is called A Woman Looking at Men Looking at Women, and I want to give this the award for the best title of the year. Just magnificent. And we have with us today Siri Husvet, who is going to, who wrote the book, of course, and she's going to help us, uh, uh, you know, understand her approach to many, many things. That's what I love about the book is it is sweeping in its intellectual journey, and there's so much meat in it and so much to talk about. Uh, Siri, thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased about it. I wanted to ask you, and when I was looking at your background, uh, you have your degree in English Lit from Columbia, right? That's right. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and now you teach in um, psychiatry. Yes, it's a strange trajectory. Yes, um, a <laughs> I wanted to know how do you get from there. One thing to the other. Actually, um, I have been interested in uh, neurology, psychiatry, um, and all things to do with the mind for a very long time. And even in my dissertation that I wrote on Dickens, um, I was focusing on how he uses pronouns and how they relate to um, identities in his books. And I got interested at that time in aphasia, and aphasia are uh, language difficulties that uh, neurological patients have after they've had uh, damage, brain damage. So it goes back for a long time, and then I've really pursued it. I wrote another book called The Shaking Woman or A History of My Nerves, which was an, <laughs> another great title. An, another <laughs> title uh, that I like too. And um, that was really investigating a uh, seizure disorder that I had, um, and it was undiagnosed. Hmm. By that time, I had been deeply uh, interested in neuroscience and neurology and psychiatry, and I developed a disorder that really uh, crossed the boundaries in some way between psychiatry and neurology. After that book was published, um, then uh, the medical community or parts of the medical community um, became interested in hearing me speak and talk about philosophical issues, especially involved in mind-body problems. And therefore, I ended up um, with an appointment at the medical school or medical college here in New York City. Well, how wonderful. But, you know, medical schools have long needed diversity. Um, Well, I think that the young psychiatrists, their psychiatric residents, who come to my seminar are deeply interested in questions that go beyond, um, say, just strict diagnostic categories, um, making checklists of symptoms. Um, They're interested in literature and philosophy and the broader questions that obtain in psychiatry. So it's been a wonderful experience. When I was in doctoral school, I had a roommate who was in uh, neuroanatomy. He was working on his PhD oh, yeah. in neuroanatomy, and nobody in my life has been more interested in poetry than he has been. Well, isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. And you know, there are um, still many, many things that we do not know about the brain. Um, but one of the fascinating uh, ongoing stories is the relationship between, uh, you know, poetry and the brain and how many poets, for example, have suffered from what used to be called manic depression Mm -hmm. and is now called bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. Is there, uh, and and is there a great deal of solid evidence of that? Well, there are theories, um, and I think there's some evidence that in uh, manic depressive disorder, there's um, 
more activity on both sides of the brain, both the left mm. and the right hemisphere are activated. Now, whether this will be the final um, thought on the question, mm-hmm. I'm not at all sure. Yeah. Well, what about someone like Emily Dickinson? Did she fit in that category? She was certainly well, a loner. There, there's no question that, at least uh, for me, Emily Dickinson was a genius of an order that is, you know, way, way, way up there. Um, She reinvented our language in some way. And how this is possible, I don't know. Um, Whether she was possessed of certain neurological gifts that most of us are unable to reach, I don't know. But she certainly was extraordinary. Well, I love that when you you said in in this book, A Woman Looking at Men Looking at Women, uh, you have this essay where you're talking about adaptive grandiosity among yes. artists, and you make the, the point, tell this wonderful story, that's why I brought it up, uh, about Emily Dickinson sending her poems to Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who, as you said, was someone uh, who uh, was not unsympathetic to her work, but he didn't understand that he was reading the work of someone who had reinvented <laughs> the English language. I love that. Yes. I think it's a great story because Emily Dickinson did, as we know, work alone. And she wrote to Higginson, who was a huge figure of the day. And um, he was not discouraging, but the letters he wrote were rather condescending. Mm -hmm. And one understands, looking at the correspondence, that Dickinson didn't alter herself one iota. In other words, despite his great stature, she knew. Mm -hmm. And she had an inner feeling of her own greatness, even though she hardly published at all. Um, She died before she would know uh, who she would become in our culture. So it's a moving story to me, this story of her indefatigable sense of herself. I love the, the you, you quote her saying that uh, she says to him, you think me uncontrolled, I have no tribunal. I love that. Yes. Well, she really was uh, isolated mm-hmm. and self-isolated as well, working um, on her poems. But it, it's, it's a tremendous story because she doesn't buckle under mm-hmm. to Higginson. What is adaptive grandiosity, when, uh, not just with her, but with others? You have other examples. Yes, I think it's, uh, it's a strange thing because it's a form of self-worth, inner self-worth, and I think artists must have it to thrive, um, that is willing to take all kinds of defeats, criticisms, Mm -hmm. condescension, even cruelty, Mm -hmm. and continue to work. And the the adaptive part of it is, I guess, Darwinian, and in in the sense that we can we can have uh, uh, a Darwinian thoughts about a single lifetime, which is that through that grandiosity, certain artists that are not encouraged continue to work uh, because they have this perhaps a grand sense of their own self-worth. I think of Oscar Wilde, who said that uh, genius is always misunderstood. Yes, yes, Oscar Wilde said a lot of wise <laughs> things. <laughs> I, well, and then we have, uh, not, not to put him in the same category, but I think of someone like Kanye West today who tells everybody he's a genius. Yes, and and that is why in psychiatry the idea of grandiosity has always been um, somewhat, uh, you know, it's been regarded as a pathology. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we all recognize certain figures, um, some of them very prominent at the moment in our politics, who suffer from a grandiosity that is not, very pleasant. In other words, uh, they're puffed up with their own self-worth in ways that um, are not so desirable. Uh, the other side would be someone like Emily Dickinson. Mm-hmm. And it, w- what about someone like Freud? Did he have this? I think 
Freud was definitely had a sense of his own grandiosity, and he fought very hard for um, for his own legacy. In fact, Freud might not be such an enormous figure if he hadn't been quite so confident. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I had a, a, a professor years ago when I was you know, an undergraduate, but I always remember this statement that he made. He said, if it weren't for Freud, there would be certain thoughts impossible today. Yes. I think this remains true. Um, Freud, who, as we know, remains a highly controversial figure, um, he... Uh, generates a lot of animosity in the culture. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I don't think anyone, whether he or she has read Freud or not, um, doesn't live inside a Freudian legacy. That is, for example, that we talk about unconscious factors. Mm -hmm. uh, And uh, we are, many of us, um, in therapy of one kind. And it was Freud who codified the idea of someone sitting in a room with another person uh, talking out uh, his or her problems. He started that? Yeah, it was really never codified before that, not before psychoanalysis. There are, of course, many doctors treating patients, right. and uh, there's uh, a neurologist that I love from uh, history, Pierre Janet who did treat his patients with a kind of talk therapy. He also used hypnosis. So there were precedents for it. But it was really Freud who created, you know, the analytic space, the room where two people sit together as a therapy. In the history of literature, how far back can we go to find uh, what you might call psychoanalysis, you know, in literature? Oh, wow. Well, um, since, you know, literature is uh, uh, always texts, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's an oral tradition that precedes it. Um, But, you know, the idea of hidden aspects in human life, which is very much part of psychoanalysis, you know, what we don't know. I mean, this goes back to the Greeks, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the idea of an examined life. Of Socrates, the unexamined life Absolutely, not worth living. Absolutely, right? it's not worth living, mm-hmm. the very famous <laughs> phrase. Well, I, I think also of the, uh, you know, the opening line of uh, the Iliad, which is uh, yes. rage, where uh, Achilles is angry because yes. he's been disrespective. It's all a psychological drama, <laughs> you know, yes. <laughs> at that yes. point. Yes, <laughs> yes. These are very, I mean, themes of, of humiliation and rage are very strong in, in, in the Greeks. And um, you, I think, who are an expert on rhetoric, mm-hmm. uh, know that this was very important to stand up for yourself if you had been slighted, um, certain, certainly in the uh, Athenian Forum. Oh, the original machis, uh, the, the the original macho. You know, machismo yes, runs all through. Yes, very much. Yes, <laughs> it goes all the way back, <laughs> for better and for worse. People will die for my ego. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, let's talk about your um, title essay in this book: the <clears throat> a woman looking at men, looking at women. And as I said, I <laughs> I select this as my best title of the year. Just magnificent. Uh, but what does it mean? Well, um, that essay is about uh, three great uh, painters, Picasso, Beckman, and de Kooning. And uh, the title came to me when I was writing about these three artists and their portraits of women. So I thought, well, here I am, a woman looking at these men looking at women. <laughs> and, and so that became the title of that essay and then the title of the book as a whole, because throughout the essays I continued to think about um, certain disciplines. Many of them, of course, uh, have been and, and are still uh, led by men and uh, how, at times, the images of women that are created in these disciplines are um, not just biased, but uh, very much seen 
through a particular cultural lens. So I'm talking about those artists um, in a way that uh, takes into account both their love for and fear of women. So tell us about Picasso. What did you learn from him? Well, Picasso, of course, is a huge figure. He has become the name most associated with uh, greatness in modern art, I think. And he had a very tormented relationship with women. Um, His work is almost always now seen uh, through these various muses, uh, always designated by their first names, something I noticed because... uh, uh, the men are never called by their first names. It's just the women, so they're, um, you know, they're condescended to in the literature about Picasso. But he was, um, yeah, he was a big macho guy, and he enjoyed tormenting the women in his life. And I think that sadism is present in the work. Hmm. The work is great. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not disputing... Um, his stature as an artist, right. but I think that one can see that his gaze, if you will, um, on women is is a very particular one, and uh, it's a very masculine mm-hmm. uh, dash macho one. How do you balance the dichotomy, if we, if there is such a thing, between the love of the beauty of women and the objectification of them? Well, you know, I do think this is a complicated question because we, all of us, I think women as well as men have a tendency to objectify our erotic objects. You know, this is part of the allure and pleasure of of seduction. Uh, So I think that always is going to play a role. And um, and then when it goes too far, then I think the other person, the object, let's say the female object, is emptied of her own subjectivity. She becomes a thing. And I think we know from the history of the world that whenever people are turned into just things, when they're robbed of their inner lives, then we are in a very bad moral place, right? I mm-hmm. mean, we saw this, it's happened to Jews, to blacks, uh, uh, you know, to women, in, to Muslims now in various moments, you know, over history, and we have to be very careful with that. Um, but again, objectification is also part of our play, our pleasure mm-hmm. in the other. When I think of uh, someone, you know, because a lot of times people are very critical of others from a different age who don't have the benefit of their, you know, moral <laughs> insights, right? <Yes. laughs> and, but I think of someone like uh, Rumi, for instance, who oh, seemed yes. very much ahead of his time by centuries in the way that, uh, you know, he, he was in a culture that normally you would think uh, w- would be terribly negative toward women, and right. he seemed quite enlightened. Oh, he was. I, I love Rumi. I think Rumi is, you know, one of the, the great sages, you know, not only a great poet, but a, a, a great sage. And um, I actually, in one of my novels, I used the epigraph is from uh, Rumi, and it was, uh, keep looking at the damaged place. That's where the light will come. It's a very beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah, Isn't I, that I beautiful? don't know that. Yeah, no, no. So, and I think that's you know, it's it's this idea that if you uh, continue to examine the injury, right, mm-hmm. uh, that some some enlightenment will will. Uh, well, you've written happen. a you've written a, a book of poetry and uh, then and five six novels, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Yes. Are, where do you feel more comfortable? I mean, obviously, by numbers, it looks like you're a novelist, but do, do you like poetry more? Um, I read poetry all the time. So I wrote that small book of poetry a long time ago. I began as a, as a poet. Um, 
started writing poems when I was a teenager and published my first poem when I was 24, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and I was a graduate uh, student then. Mm -hmm. And one day, after having been stuck, really uh, had writer's block with my poems, I was talking to a fellow poet and a professor of mine at Columbia, David Shapiro, and he said to me, Siri, when I get really stuck, I do automatic writing. I just sit down and let it happen, Mm -hmm. and this loosens me up. So I did that, and it came out in prose quite naturally. I wrote 30 pages of prose in a single night, and then I spent the next three months editing that 30 pages into a prose poem. And I actually never wrote in lines again, except I have written some poems for some of my characters in the novels. Oh, I, I like that when people do that, to give, give you a special insight to a character through a poem they might write. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not writing as myself, but as one of the characters. Mm-hmm. It's a different exercise. The... Um one of your other titles in your in your novel, the the summer without men, that's another really good title. <laughs> Why did you have a summer without men? <laughs> uh, well, it was it's my only real comedy, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, it the plot of the book is is quite banal. It's a, a, a woman whose uh, husband suddenly leaves her. Um, he takes a pause in the marriage, and the pause turns out to be a French woman that he's fallen head, head over heels in love with. But the um, the pleasure of writing the book, and I hope of reading that particular book, The Summer Without Men, is the way that it's told. It's uh, told in a very high uh, comic style with some uh, seriousness, and all the male characters are shadows in the book. Um, the husband sends emails. Um, there are some husbands uh, that are, you know, dead, removed, or far mm-hmm. away. But all the central action takes place among women. How interesting. Well, I must read it. I, again, <laughs> I it, hope you have uh, fun with uh, it. It's not that long. <laughs> I, you know, I have, uh, again, uh, I had not heard of your work uh, until this one arrived on my desk. Yes, so, well, that's, it's, uh, it's, you know, people, I do have some readers who read my um, nonfiction and mm-hmm. then other readers who read my fiction, uh, so it doesn't always cross over. And uh, I have actually, some of the essays at, at the end of the book were originally published in science journals, you know, <laughs> we obscure uh Places such as Seizure, the European Journal of Epilepsy, mm. and uh, Clinical <laughs> Neurophysiology. So some of those are are pretty uh, out there. Uh, yes. Uh, well, well, that was one of the things that attracted me to your work <laughs> is I realized how incredibly eclectic you're, like a you know modern Renaissance woman. It also fits with something I'm always told. Uh, younger people in college, I say, you know, uh, you people in liberal arts like to complain that people in sciences aren't well versed, but you're you're not well versed in the sciences. No, I think it's so important, and I have to say that um, having now spent many years also immersed in science, mm-hmm. uh, that it has given me a flexibility of thought that I couldn't have had otherwise. I think it's very important for uh, people who care about these things to train themselves in various modes of thought because, you know, the scientific method is different from uh, the, the ways that one works in the humanities. And to have both modes of thinking active in your own mind, I think, is uh, is healthy and uh, allows for a kind of elastic inner life that isn't possible if you don't have it. The friend I told you about who was my roommate who went to, uh, got his doctorate in neuroanatomy, uh, yes. when, way back then he handed me a book. He said, you need to read this book from the sciences. It's It's poetry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what he, book was it? He gave me Notes of a Biology Watcher oh. from Lewis Thomas. 
Yes, and yes. I loved it, and I went on to read, you know, three more of his books. And, yeah. and so that was my, that kind of began my journey to reading, uh, you know, Feynman and other, uh, you know, great scientists. Well, yes, and of course, when you look at the great physicists um, of the 20th century, um, especially someone, I, I think my favorite is uh, Niels Bohr. He was, he loved Dickens, for example. Oh. And yes, he was a great lover of Dickens, and uh, he read Kierkegaard very, very carefully. And uh, I read an essay by a scholar who suggested, and I think it's probably very true, that without Bohr's appreciation for um, philosophical ambiguities, um, without the kind of daringness that he had because he was broadly read. He might not have happened on his discoveries in physics. Well, I, I've thought that. I've thought that it must uh, create uh, a kind of um, empowered creativity in people if they are diverse in their reading. Well, you know, we like to say we are what we eat, <laughs> we are what <laughs> but we I read. think we are what we read. read as well. And so even though we now live in a culture where people are talking about just getting children to read, oh, they just get them to read, I think it is very important what we read mm -hmm. and how we decide to read. And at one uh, moment in my life, I realized how important it was to read against myself. In other words, to choose texts that didn't have my automatic sympathy. Oh, that's and wonderfully put. I love that. You you know how mm -hmm. we we all have personalities, and they're formed in various ways, and that those personalities. Uh, attract us to one thing over another. So I have spent at least oh, a good part of my reading life um, investigating uh, disciplines and writers who I don't automatically take to, even some of them who uh, go against the grain. And mm -hmm. I found this to also be really good for one's, um, I don't know, the, the dancing in one's own mind. Can you give us a title that you that went against oh, your sympathy? I've read quite a bit of, um, for example, uh, I've read quite a number of uh, analytical philosophers who I have to say I find difficult and sometimes very cold. And, uh, so, for example, uh, an interesting philosopher such as Quine, I must say I struggled uh, with Quine, but I'm glad uh, that... I've read some Quine, uh, some uh, another philosopher, Hilary Putnam, uh, really uh, went against the grain. But mm -hmm. now I am <laughs> glad that I have some Hilary Putnam mm -hmm. in me. <laughs> well, those are good. Those are good examples. Uh, yeah, it reminds yeah. me also of Twain, who's, who tried to read against the grain, you might say, and he, he, yeah. he said he tried to read <laughs> Henry James' Ambassadors, and he found that once he put that book down, he just couldn't pick it up again. <laughs> yes, well, uh, James is a good example um, of a writer. I happen to love Henry James, mm -hmm. but I also have uh, dear, beloved uh, people in my life whose literary tastes I admire who simply cannot deal with James. So mm. there you are. That's a matching of personalities. Well, with Twain, you can never tell whether he's telling the truth or whether he's just going for the good joke, you know. That's right. He was very hard on, on a number of yeah. uh, uh, writers. Yes. Uh, Jane Austen, I think, yes, was his Jane favorite Austin foil. Yes, is, is maybe the worst, you know. The divine Jane, how could he? Yes. And I think that's why, because she was sacred, so he had to Yeah, had to so he had apart. to stomp on it, yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I'm grateful for our time together, and we'll have to do this again. We have so much more to talk about. Absolutely. Well, it was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. We've been talking with Siri Hustvet. Uh, the title is A Woman Looking at Men, Looking at Women, a wonderful collection of essays. You need to pick this up. Great holiday reading. For Good Books Radio, I've been your host today, Dr. W.F. Strong. Here's hoping that all your books are good reads.